Hey guys, welcome to Mad Scientist Barbecue. I'm Jeremy Yoder. It's getting close to dinner time and I need something delicious and fast. So today I'm gonna to show you how to grill a steak. Today we're gonna to be cooking with wood coals because I think it provides the most flavor, but that involves burning the wood down into coals. So that takes a minute. I'm gonna light it up right now so we can talk about how we're gonna cook this steak while those are burning down. Let's talk really briefly about why we're burning wood down into coals as our heat source rather than using charcoal or propane. And it comes down to one big reason, and that is flavor. Because when you burn down wood into coals, you get some of that smoke flavor that you get from burning wood like you would with a smoker, but it does take more time and requires more effort than using something like charcoal, but the trade-off is more flavor. There's a reason why whole hog cookers will take a burn barrel and burn tons of wood into those wood coals to cook a hog because it produces more flavor. You could do it with charcoal, but it's just not the same flavor. Now the technique we're gonna to use to cook these steaks is gonna be applicable to propane, natural gas, charcoal, wood coals, whatever kind of grill you have, this will work. But the best flavor in my opinion is if you burn it down into coals. You may be asking what kind of wood should you burn down into coals? The short answer is any wood that you can use for barbecue, you could use for this purpose. But a particular favorite is people burning down mesquite. Now I don't have any mesquite. Mesquite is a very strong flavor and it doesn't work really well for barbecue in my opinion, but it's great for grilling because it has such a strong flavor and you want to impart the flavor in such a short amount of time. But today we're using pecan, you can use oak, you can use hickory, you can use whatever barbecue wood you have on hand to make excellent coals to make incredible steaks. One more thing I want to say about coals is make sure you burned everything down into coals. There aren't pieces of wood in there that are still burning in open flame because you don't want flame because that's going to char and burn the meat. What we want is coals because of the radiant heat. Now I've tried to illustrate radiant heat before and I'll do my best again and hopefully this makes sense to you. But if you've ever been to a bonfire and somebody throws something like a cardboard box onto the bonfire, you might be 30 feet away. The cardboard box goes up. Whoosh, all at once and you feel a wave or a pulse of heat. That's radiant heat. It wasn't heating up all the air in between you and the fire, but it was actual light waves that were radiating from the fire that made you feel warm on your skin and that's what radiant heat is. Those coals provide lots of radiant heat. We don't want open flame because the radiant heat we can keep pretty level and by varying the distance between the meat and the coals, we can get a very steady temperature which means we get great searing without charring. Now, this is gonna be cooking with live fire, so there's always gonna be a little bit of charring, but we wanna get even browning more than charring. And the last thing you might be saying is, well, if you just want even browning, why don't you use a pan? As a matter of fact, I do usually use a pan, but sometimes you just want that primal cooked with open flame taste that you get from cooking with a real fire. And this is one of those nights where I just have to have that. Plus I have a new toy, the Workhorse 1975 with the cowboy grill, so I gotta use that too. But this is how I love to grill steaks even though 95% of the time I'm cooking in a carbon steel pan. So while those coals get ready, let's get the steaks and get them ready. The first thing you're gonna need is a great steak. And the first thing you look for is great marbling. What you want is something that has fat running all the way through it. So it doesn't just have fat around the outside, but fat actually in the muscle, that's intramuscular fat. And that's what's gonna make your steak juicy. The steak we're cooking today is a Denver steak, and this one's from Porter Road. I was introduced to Denver steaks when I was actually doing a steak competition at the Barbecue HQ in Simi Valley. We had all of these ribeyes that we were cooking for the steak competition, and do you know what we were eating? Denver steaks, because Eric was like, hey, check out these. I got these in the fridge back here. These are amazing. So we cooked up some Denver steaks. They were incredible. I didn't even touch the ribeyes because the Denver steaks were so darn good. And this one from Porter Road, I know is gonna be great. A big thank you to Porter Road for sponsoring today's video. I love all of the beef and actually all the meat that I've ever gotten from Porter Road. The beef is very special because it's raised on pasture and then it's finished with some grain so you get that great intramuscular marbling, but you get the really rich taste of something raised on pasture. They raise their animals ethically, so that means a great tasting product. And for you guys, if you're interested in some Denver steaks or some of the other cuts that are my favorite, you can click on the link in the description and you automatically get 15% off of your first Porter Road order. So 
Not only do you get access to a great steak from a great company, you also get that 15% discount. And if you've ever wanted to dabble a little bit in some of that dry aged flavor, they actually hang the carcasses for a couple weeks to get some of that enzymatic breakdown and a little bit of that dry aged flavor without being overpowering. So this is a great way to get started. I highly recommend you go over there and check them out because from the pork wings to the Denver steaks, to the briskets, to the beef ribs, they have some amazing stuff and it gets shipped right to your door. Go check them out. But I'm gonna cut this thing open and let's get started. Oh, I almost forgot to mention. Denver Steaks. The name Denver, no idea why it's called Denver. Maybe it's just a marketing thing, but it comes from the chuck of a cow. So this is a steak that the general public doesn't really know about, but it's kind of what you might call a butcher's cut. So butchers have known about it for a long time, and I hadn't heard of it until that steak competition, but you guys are all hearing about it right now. It is super flavorful. There's lots of marbling, so it's gonna be juicy. We just don't want to overcook it, and to make sure we don't overcook it, I have my thermopen, which is an invaluable resource in any kind of outdoor cooking. If you don't have one, Check out the link in the description, it's totally worth it. But I'm gonna get this out and salt it heavily. salted this generously because we want salt to penetrate all the way through the meat because that's what's going to bring out that beef flavor. So if you don't salt it, it just feels really bland and lackluster. If you cooked a steak that's thick and you salt the outside but the center doesn't get any salt, you know what I'm talking about. That's why a lot of times people use finishing salt. So definitely, if at all possible, you want to salt your steak the day before and then the next day after the salt has had time to penetrate, you put it on the grill. So I actually have some steaks that I've already salted and so that's what we're gonna be using, but this is the approximate amount of salt that I would use. Put it in the fridge, then when it's time, get it out to cook it. Another note, I don't get them out and let them come to room temperature before grilling. I want the inside to be cold to make sure that it doesn't overcook because we're gonna sear this hard on the outside and I want to be in complete control of how much heat enters the center so that I get it exactly as done as I want. Also notice I didn't add any pepper or garlic powder or you know chipotle powder or anything like that. Though all those are great seasonings, the reason why I didn't add those is because typically they will burn when you're cooking at such high heat. So you can add it later. You can just use a small amount. Some of those really fine powders can you know survive the cook. But for me, I salt it and then I add some fresh cracked pepper at the end. And to me, that is a beautiful steak. These logs have almost burned down into coals. They still need a few more minutes, but just before they're ready to be spread out, there might be a couple small flames around that will go out. But what you don't want is chunks that are still burning in open flame when you actually go to sear your steak. Right now, the radiant heat from this is pretty intense. That's about as close as I can get my hand and leave it there. And I probably couldn't leave it there for more than 30 seconds. So that means we have high temps, which is great for searing. Now we have the coals ready, so it's only coals, no open flame. We're gonna put those steaks on. We're gonna leave the lid open because I want that radiant heat to sear one side. I'm not trying to get these things cooked right now. I'm trying to sear them. We're gonna worry about the internal temperature later. I just checked the great temperature with my Thermopen IR. So it's got the infrared thermometer on one end, and then I have the digital instant read probe on the other end. This is what I always use when grilling. When I'm doing only barbecue, then I use the Thermopen one, but this is a great tool. So we got 519 degrees on the grate. It kind of varied between about 500, five degrees and 600 degrees. But if you ever need more heat, put up more coals under where you're cooking. If you need less heat, scoop some of the coals away. I just have a shovel that I use for that. It's very low tech, but very effective. So let's get our pre-brined steaks on the grill. As 
it starts to cook, we're starting to get that grilled meat smell. And some of that fat is gonna liquefy, drip into the coals, and provide some fat smoke flavor. So if you wanna know what that's like, if you've ever smelled burgers being cooked, and you're like, somebody's cooking burgers, that's exactly what I'm talking about. So we should have wood smoke flavor plus fat smoke flavor, and we should have a great even sear. Now, another thing a lot of people are really, really wary about doing is flipping the steak over. Don't worry about that at all. You need to check to make sure nothing's burning and you're getting adequate browning. A lot of times people will overcook their steaks because they're cooking at a temperature that's too low because they're after that sear, they're after that sear, but they're just not cooking hot enough to get the sear that they're after because for that Maillard reaction to take place, you probably need to be 350 surface temperature minimum. And so that means that if you have water on the outside surface, you're not gonna have the Maillard reaction because water boils at 212. So as long as there's water there, you're not gonna reach the adequate temperature. So what does that mean? You have to get rid of all the water. First, maybe pat it dry with a paper towel if necessary. But if it's dry enough, you can put it on and you want so much heat that it evaporates the water and you get that even browning. And if you need a pair of tongs to check to make sure you're getting the browning that you're after, that's not a problem. Take a look put it back down. There's not any virtue in leaving it on one side and not flipping it except for once. It's just kind of like a chef myth that has been carried on. Maybe it's because people weren't leaving the meat on there long enough to brown adequately. So you can take a look, you can put it right back down. Don't worry about the grill marks. Grill marks are strictly aesthetic. They don't provide any flavor. So we're not after grill marks, we're after even browning. And if it just happens to look nice, even better. Just make sure you leave the meat on there long enough first so that it will release from the metal. Because first, when it goes on cold, it'll stick to the metal. And then after maybe a minute or so, it gets hot enough that it will release. Then you can start looking. So I'm gonna grab some tongs and see where we are. Starting to get the browning we're after. Want a little bit more. Okay, at this point, we have the sear on the outside that we want and conveniently doing it with this 1975. All I have to do to bring it up to temp now is put it in the main cook chamber. I might add a log or two just to move the cook along because I don't want it to take forever. And then when it reaches an internal temp of 128, I'll pull it off, let it rest, and then it's gonna be done exactly the way I want. So you may have heard of doing reverse sear. Now, if you're just a, a beginner, reverse sear is a great way to make sure you don't overcook your steaks. But for me, I'm so concerned about getting a perfect sear that I wanna sear first, and when that's perfect, then I'll worry about getting it to the exact right temperature. Now, both ways work, but in my experience, you get a better flavor from the Maillard reaction if you sear first and then bring up the temp rather than bringing to the correct internal temp and then searing. You do it however you want. You can do this process in reverse if you want some barbecue type smoke flavor on the steak first and then get your sear. But for my money, I'm gonna sear first and then bring it up to temp. When they reach the internal temperature that you want, pull them off. So we got the sear that we want and then we brought it up to the temperature that we want. Thanks to our thermopan, we were able to nail that exactly where we wanted it. And then it's crucial to let your steak rest. And one thing to keep in mind, and this applies to whether you're searing and then bringing up to temp or reverse searing, 
is the hotter you're cooking at the end, the more carryover cooking you get. Carryover cooking is the temperature rising even after you pull it off of the heat because the outside layers get really hot and slowly they transfer their energy toward the center. So you might pull it off and it might go from 128, 129, 132, 133, 134, 135. That's why I pull it at 128 because to me, when I do it this way, that gives me the perfect level of doneness. And then let it rest, give it 10 minutes. Okay, you can wait 10 minutes and then slice into it. If you look at this steak, we have a nice even brown all the way around, and then the inside should be beautifully done, should be nice and medium rare. So we're gonna slice this open, hit it with some fresh cracked black pepper, and then finally, give it a taste test. Also, thank you to Michael DeLong, a viewer who made this cutting board and gave it to me. I really appreciate it. This thing is sweet. Take a look at the grain right here. You wanna slice against the grain, so we don't wanna do it like this. We wanna slice against the grain, so we're gonna cut it like this, okay? It's important to do it this way because if you don't, it won't be as tender as it otherwise would be. It's gonna have a really nice beefy flavor because it's from the chuck, but we want it to be tender. add any pepper before cooking because I didn't want it to burn so I have this neat little machine that grinds pepper for me fresh so we're gonna hit it with some of that and give it a taste test got a little piece to try here beautiful crust on the outside we didn't slice all the way through the steak but hopefully you guys can hear this so we got the crust we were after. It's a nice, beautiful, even brown. Nothing is burned. It was exactly the way we wanted, and the doneness is exactly how I wanted it too. So a little bit of fresh pepper. Smells so good. Oh, oh so beefy. Oh, the crust is where all that flavor is. Mm. Then the pepper just balances it out. So to me, that has everything a great steak needs to have, and it's got a great, great beef flavor because it comes from the chuck. Now, you don't want to overcook this. I took this one to 128. You might want to take it a little further if you want more done. So if you want medium, if you want medium well, if you want something like that, then just take it a few degrees further. But just keep in mind, there will be some carryover cooking. Now, to me, this is gonna be a great dinner for me and for my family. I encourage you guys to get out there. With this method, you get that great crust Plus you get that smoke flavor from the direct heat coals. This is the absolute best way to grill a steak in my opinion. Now, if I'm cooking a steak, most of the time I'm cooking in a pan, but this is something you can't replace. There's something so visceral about cooking meat with fire and the flavor you get is something completely singular. You're not gonna find this by any other means. So try this out. Let me know in the comments if you cook over direct heat coals like this and what your experiences are and how you like to cook steaks because for me, I'm always learning. So let me know what you think and I'll be sure to read those. And thanks again to Porter Road for sponsoring today's video. I've loved their stuff for a long time and I highly, highly recommend you go check it out. If you guys wanna get more Mad Scientist Barbecue content, you can follow me on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter at Mad Scientist Barbecue. And if you wanna enter the monthly contests on Patreon where you can win smokers, you can win aprons, you can win free entrances into my barbecue classes, you can win thermopens, you can win all kinds of stuff in those contests, and you get access to the Discord where there are hundreds of people who love barbecue and love to discuss it. Go over to Patreon and check that out. I'll put links for everything in the description below. Thank you guys for watching. I'll see you next time.